Good morning students. Welcome to today's lesson summary review. We're continuing with the course relating to Christ, John's Gospel. And this week we're going to review session 9, which is John chapter 16 and 17. Now this session will help you to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of praying in Jesus' name, and aspects of Jesus' farewell prayer for his disciples. And in personal preparation for this lesson, as all of our lessons are, you want to make sure to monitor your prayer time this week. And question to ask yourself, are you praying in Jesus' name? Are you praying about things that are concerns of Jesus? And so let us pray right now before we get started with this lesson review. Father, I thank you for each and every student that is studying these lessons around the world. I pray that their prayer life will be changed as a result of studying this week's lesson and that you will bless them and prosper them in every way, mind, body, and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, students, welcome to our lesson summer review for the course relating to Christ, John's Gospel. We're looking at John chapter 16 and 17 this week. And as you work through your study guide, a lesson guide, as you study through your lesson, we're going to look at the lesson plan and we're going to review the activities um, and questions that you had with this lesson. So if we take a look at our introduction, which you'll find on pages 138 on in your study guide and as you think about the introduction for this lesson I want you to reflect on a time when someone that you loved was about to leave you and the question I want you to ask yourself is who was the sorrow for you see oftentimes our sorrow is for ourselves not so much for the person leaving and this is a natural reaction so we will note at the beginning of John chapter 16, Jesus' disciples are full of sorrow and fear because of Jesus' startling announcement that he is leaving and they can't go with him. Furthermore, Jesus has just told them that they will be persecuted. They are so depressed that they have not sought the answer to Peter's question which was addressed in John chapter 13, verse 36, where Peter asks, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus points this out, not to fault them, but to help them understand that his leaving is a part of the mission of his coming. His return to the Father will usher in the glorious advent or the second coming or the coming of the Holy Spirit. We are living still in the age of the Holy Spirit until Jesus returns. So let's take a look at our first lesson outline, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll be looking at John chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. You find this on pages 138 through 140 in your study guide. Now, this first objective asks us to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to refer you to Jesus' statement that's found in verse 7. It is for your good that I am going away, Jesus says. So this probably made no sense at all to the disciples. They had given up everything to follow Jesus. Jesus had been at the center of their universe for years now. Life without him was unthinkable. So what would they do? Where would they go? From a human point of view, Jesus leaving meant catastrophe for the early disciples. Now let me ask you a question. Why is Jesus leaving good for the disciples? If you take a look at the lesson material as well as the verse 7, his leaving will allow him to send the Holy Spirit to them. The Holy Spirit is a divine helper, would be an advantage because Jesus in his limited physical body could only be 
one place at a time. But the Holy Spirit will be able to minister to countless believers simultaneously. I also like to explain to you that the Holy Spirit's ministry to the world through his threefold work of convicting. First way he convicts us is found in verses 11, 8 through 11. Let's take a look at these threefold work of the Holy Spirit in bringing conviction into our lives. The first area of convicting is convicting about sin. See, a human tendency is to blame others. If I bang my toe on a chair placed in the middle of a room, I might say, who put that chair there? Rather than, I should have been more careful. So it is with sin. The natural person has no understanding of why he or she needs to be saved, especially if he or she thinks of themselves as a good person. It is only when the Holy Spirit convicts their heart of sin that they see their desperate condition and turn to Christ. A second area of convicting is convicting about righteousness. True righteousness is provided by Christ's atoning death. And only the Holy Spirit can reveal to a person that a righteous status before God depends on Christ's death for us, not our own good works. A third way the Holy Spirit brings conviction is convicting about judgment. Through Christ's atoning death, Satan is defeated. The evil in the world, pride, envy, hatred, rebellion, unbelief is condemned. Take a look at verse 18. Only the Holy Spirit can bring about conviction of one's condemned status, which leads to repentance. Jesus' victory in being resurrected to the Father is a decisive triumph over Satan. It has continuing consequences. For the church has victory as do individual believers. Now I want each of you to identify the Holy Spirit's ministry to believers that is mentioned in verse number 13. Take a look at verse 13. And we'll see at least three areas that we can identify of the Holy Spirit's ministry to us as believers. First, he guides us into all truth. The Holy Spirit enables us to understand God's word and to discern between teaching that exalts Christ and that which exalts man. Second, he speaks not on his own, but only what he hears. The personal word that the Spirit speaks to our hearts will never conflict with God's written word. The Spirit's public utterances, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues will always exalt Christ. Third, he tells us what is yet to come. He does this through the written scripture and prophetic words. For reference, take a look at Acts chapter 20, verse 20 to 23, Acts chapter 21, verse 4, as well as verses 10 to 11 of Acts 21. I also like to note that the Holy Spirit has one other ministry, and that is to bring glory to Jesus. You find that in verse 14. So hopefully you be in this section, be able to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about the sadness and gladness that was experienced by the disciples upon Jesus' statements. The second objective asks us to explain the power of praying in Jesus' name. So let me ask. What does Jesus say will turn the disciples' sorrow and pain to joy? The statement that he gave them was, he says he will see them again. Let me ask again another question. 
What would be the second source of joy for the disciples? Well, you'll see in the lesson that they will receive what they ask for in Jesus' name. And at this, I like to stress that this promise is for all believers in every generation. The next section of our lesson talks about victory over the world. We find this in John chapter 16, verses 25 through 33. This is pages 141 through 143 of your study guide. Our third objective asks us to explain how we can have peace even in the midst of trouble. Now, I'd like to point out the clear teaching that is mentioned or given in verses 26 through 27. These verses, we can go directly to God in prayer because he loves us. That means that we need no intermediary. We need no one else to stand in our place before God. We can go, as the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church, we can go boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy, to help us in our time of need. I also want you to observe that that though the disciples arrived at a deeper faith in Jesus, see verse 30, they are still not strong enough to stand firm in the face of disaster, as we see in verses 32. So at this point, I'd like to stress that Christ's church today is not built on people's strength, but on God's ability to use people even after they have failed. When our faith fails, we may give up on ourselves. Others may give up on us, but God does not give up. I want you to recite John chapter 16, verse 33. And this reminds us that in the midst of all trials, our source of peace is Christ because he has already overcome the world. Let's take a look at our next section outline for the lesson. We're going to be looking at John chapter 17 now. And this lesson outline talks about Jesus prays for his disciples. You'll see this on pages 146 through 153 of your study guide. So first, in this section, we see that Jesus prayed for himself. And I'd like to comment that Jesus' prayer on the eve of his arrest concerns the needs of himself, as we see in verses 1 through 5, the needs of the disciples, as outlined in verses 6 through 19, and the needs of future believers, as we see listed in verses 20 through 26. So let me ask, what two things does Jesus ask for himself? As we look at the scripture verses and the lesson outline, we see one, he asks that God will glorify him. He says, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Glory in John's Gospels means voluntarily give up one's exalted and powerful status for lowly service. For Jesus, this meant giving up his supreme place in heaven to suffer at the hands of evil men and to die a horrible death in order to open the way of salvation. You see a reference for this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. The second thing Jesus asked for for himself that was that you glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So if we were to take a look at John chapter 17, verse 3. We can define eternal life as knowing God. And this is a life-changing experience 
that begins at the time of salvation and continues throughout eternity. So now we see what Jesus prayed for his disciples. The subjective asks us to describe what Jesus prayed for concerning his disciples. So first he prayed that they may be one as he and the Father is one. So we can see that although we do not need an intermediary to go to God in prayer, Jesus continues praying for us. He always lives to intercede for us. You can see a reference for that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. At this point, I want you to think about a personal testimony of knowing God. Of how God, of how knowing God has changed your life and affects your daily life. Remember, knowing God is a life-changing experience that begins at the time of our salvation and continues on. So think about a personal experience of how knowing God has changed your life and how knowing God affects your daily lives. So in this lesson review, we have looked, taken a look at John chapter 16 and 17. I certainly pray that you will meditate upon what we've learned and that it will continue to impact your life on a daily basis that we studied about the work of the Holy Spirit. We looked at the gladness and sadness that the disciples experienced. We, we looked at how Jesus explained to them that they, we have victory over the world. And then in chapter 17, we saw how Jesus prays for himself, prays for the disciples, and prays for future believers. We can take comfort in knowing that Jesus is still alive in us through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that this impacts your life daily in meaningful, powerful, and positive ways. Until our next time of coming together, thank you for allowing me to come into your home today, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. May God bless and prosper your day. Good day. You have been listening to Grace Bible College and Seminary. We are blessed that you tuned in to our lesson today and look forward to connecting with you for more lessons in the future. Feel free to reach out to us for more information about our school, and programs of study. Grace, Bible College and Seminary, an apostolic school of global mission. Where vision becomes mission, www.gbcs.education.